Get ready to be inspired by the people, stories, and opportunities in Africa, where a global community of Africans and friends of Africa with no boundaries. Together, we celebrate the continent's successes and help provide solutions to some of its greatest challenges. Impact Africa airs live every Sunday at 9 a.m. Eastern Time, 1 p.m. GMT at listenvisionlive.com. You can also catch previous episodes on iTunes and on the show's website, impactafricaonline.com. Connect with Impact Africa on Twitter and Facebook at UImpactAfrica. Together, we'll discover that the real Africa is full of amazing talents and great opportunities. Welcome to Impact Africa. Africa has long been associated with needing aid and handouts. Today, you'll learn so much more about this wonderful continent from enlightening stories, people, and ideas. Now, here is your host, Tope Fajin Basi. Good morning, America. Good afternoon, Africa. Welcome to Impact Africa. It's a delight and a pleasure to be here again today and uh, to count down the year 2014 with you wonderful audience that we have. I hope it's been a good year. I hope that you've been impacting Africa. I hope our guests have been inspiring you, as I'm sure these two wonderful ladies here are going to inspire you today. Today, I'm joined by some people who are doing things that I cannot even think about doing. Anything that has to do with science, you know how I feel about it. <laughs> I don't really know the answer. But a continent that is not progressing, that is not thriving science-wise, isn't going anywhere. So today I'm going to talk to people who are trying to change that for Africa, who are trying to put science and technology at the forefront of African affairs. Today I have Carol Ibe. She's the founder and CEO of JR Biotech. Is it JR or Junior? JR. Well, you know, I wasn't sure. I was like, is it JR or Junior JR. Biotech? JR Biotech. Right. We'll come to that name very soon. <laughs> okay. And then I have my nice Gambian sister who hasn't taken me to Gambia yet, <laughs> Geneva Cisse. And she's the chief financial advisor of JR Biotech. And she's also a senior vice president, a very senior banker, you know, specializing in small businesses with MT Bank in the Maryland area. Yes. You're welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. So why is it JR Biotech? Well, that's an interesting <laughs> question. So I'm a Christian, and um, I had this vision like many years ago. Um, so Jesus Reigns is the name, is what JR stands for. Ah. And because I had this vision like about seven years ago, eight years while I was doing my master's at Georgetown, and then I was thinking of a name, like what name can I possibly give it? You know, when it comes to selecting a name for a company, you know, you want to name it your son's name or your, <laughs> or name, your, name. Or your name or oh, something. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing was actually fitting, you know. I had to actually take a moment and, you know, say a prayer about this and ah. woke up and had Jesus reigns. So I was like, wow, sounds good. So I'm going to give it JR and then biotech because it's all absolutely, you know, a, a biotechnology company. And so, you know, we had to put something bio and tech in it. And ah. so that's how the name came about. And, you know, I'm very happy about that. Wow, because, you know, when I was writing notes this morning, I'm saying, JR, 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 but now we know. <laughs> but you see, now she gave me an idea because I know you are also a career coach and you you are you do a lot of professional advisory mm -hmm. services and the name of your company is Ebroso. Yes. Where did that name come from? Okay, she had just <laughs> said it earlier. Like you said, when you do in a company, you think of your children, your name. So mine came from my three children, Ibrahim, ah. Uzman, and Sharif Omar. So just took each of them their two initials. Ah. That's how came up. I hope you've paid them for this copyright. Mm -hmm. If they know about it. <laughs> when I know well, paying them, I'm not giving it. <laughs> because now they know, because they're watching this, I'm hoping. Right. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping, but you know, fantastic. Before I go into, you know, Gerald Biotech and this science in Africa, let's talk a little bit about your background because right. you, I've not really met many people who've gone to as many schools as you've gone to, <laughs> but you know, masters in this, I was really a bio, I'm like, masters in this, two masters, yeah. an undergraduate degree in, is it biochemistry? Microbiology. Microbiology. Right. Their sisters and brothers, I'm hoping. <laughs> I'm an accountant, so you know I don't really know these things. That's okay. But, uh, 
But, you know, tell me a little bit about your growing up years. Then you came here. Then you went to Oxford University, which I also went to. So I'm oh, very, wow. yes, awesome. I'm very excited about that. But tell me a little bit about, you know, your journey here. Right. So, well, I have a bachelor's degree in microbiology. Um, and I had a degree from a university in Nigeria, in Abia State, to be precise. And um, during my undergraduate program, you know, third year, I think it was, we were introduced to the concept of molecular biology and biotechnology. What does that um, mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at that time, I was like, what is that? You know? And then, you know, we had only one professor who actually could walk us through the basics of molecular biology, like, you know, DNA, what it is, but that stopped there. He couldn't go any farther. And then we did not have, like, the infrastructure, standard laboratories that we could actually do this practical because all of what biotechnology and molecular biology is all about is all about the practical, the hands-on. If you don't get it, you can teach the concepts. And so at that time, you know, I became very passionate about biotechnology because, you know, we were told that it has a lot of industrial applications in the environment in the industry in healthcare and agriculture and so I thought okay well this is something that I probably want to do and so I decided to do a master's degree in molecular biology and biochemistry specializing in biotechnology at the Georgetown University here in Washington DC hmm. and so during that program we were you know introduced to the concept the techniques the applications and it was awesome so that actually helped me to jumpstart my career in the area of scientific research. I was very uh, fortunate to get an award to do an internship at the National Institute of um, Health. Huh, um, nice. And so at that time, you know, it was research, you know, I was involved in it, I learned a lot of techniques. And so within that time, I started thinking, wow, you know, I know where I'm coming from in Nigeria, we didn't have this. And I know that some of the students that I was with at the time, we really wanted to know more, but we just couldn't because there was no, um, we didn't have the infrastructure, we didn't have the, you know, the expertise, nothing was there so no, what can I do? Yes. Right. so <laughs> yeah. what can I do to go back you know and, and and make an impact in this area you know in Nigeria and that's how I started thinking of maybe coming up with an idea of setting up the company but this was like in 2005 six huh. and so but wow. for me to do that I knew that I had to acquire more training of course you know because when you have a company it's also good that you're not just being an entrepreneur but also you know kind of what your the science behind your products or your services or whatever you're doing um, to be able to champion it you know yeah. in a very good way and so you know I worked for about two and a half years at a naval research lab here in Washington, D.C., and decided to go back to school and do a master's in clinical embryology. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I'm sure I read that this morning, but I was like, clinical, what is well, that? Again, yeah. I'm just going to, I know, I'm I going to have her just talk about it. I don't <laughs> need to learn it. I know. <laughs> it's okay. It's not, it doesn't, it's not that complicated. And, hmm. and, and, and so I did do But you can't say it's not rocket science. <laughs> well, it's not rocket science. Okay. <laughs> So I got my master's in clinical embryology from the University of Oxford. And then also my passion also, you know, I had, you know, that drive to do something. I knew that I just had to. And so, you know, I worked again at the National Institute of Health and, you know, went back to the University of Cambridge where I was going to do my PhD at the time, but it's on hold right now, but going back hopefully in the future wow. um, to finish up. But the whole thing, I really don't. I don't know. I don't want to say I don't like to go to school that much. <laughs> You've done lots of school. When, when, you, <laughs> when you have the passion to do something, and the thing that we're doing, which is science based, is intellectually based, um, I can't just sit down and fold my arms and expect that it's going to go well. I yeah. have to be well equipped. You yeah. know, I have to gain the the proper skills, the knowledge, the experience to be able to give back to the set of. Uh, target beneficiaries that we are looking at and and and, doing, and that's very significant which brings me i know you also spent some time in nigeria Geneva, mm -hmm. when you were growing up and i don't I, i'm not really sure about the university system in gambia but did you have a background in gambia before coming to the u.s yes or no? yeah yeah so in gambia pretty much it's one university that we have over there yeah one university, university. yes, yes. We okay, well, million, there are only the 2 million country. people in Gambia. Yes, That's yeah. why I love the country so much. Yes, because it's a very, very <laughs> small country. And even the university really came along not too long ago. That's why if you look at the, the, the population of the Gambia, mm -hmm. almost half of, like, when you finish high school, the next thing is ah, you either try to go be a teacher at okay. the Gambia College. Okay. Or um, you go and do um, the nursing program. Okay. Those are the two available, or you have to just leave the country. Oh. So that's why if you look at it, the Gambia has one of the most brain drain um, 
oh. people because you have to go out in order to go further your education. Mm -hmm. uh, mm. Until the, the current government we have, when they came on board, of course, um, it got extended to become a university with different branches. Mm -hmm. So most of the programs at our universities are at an infant stage right now in the game. Wow. Any yeah. science-based, like, does the university have a college of medicine? or Right now they so do, yes. They do. It started, but it's all at the infantry level mm -hmm. at this point, yes. Wow, I didn't know there was only one university. It's called the University of the Gambia. Right. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Compared but to Nigeria. Nigeria, yes. but Nigeria has an estimated 2 million people. Right at any point in time in university, university. in the mm -hmm. university or polytechnics mm -hmm. or some sort of tertiary education. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> it's not, it's not even, it's not the quantity right. of people. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's, it's, it's the quality and right. it's getting bad. I graduated from the University of Lagos in 1998. Okay. And one of the most shocking things that happened to me was I graduated with a degree in accounting and immediately I finished school. I went to try to get my equivalent of a CPA, the mm -hmm. ICANN. Mm -hmm. And to my shock and dismay, some of the things they were teaching us about profit and loss statements, they were teaching us T-type, yeah. and the world didn't use that again. Right. Yes. <laughs> it didn't happen. My brother graduated from the same university, mm -hmm. and I'm not looking at love University of Lagos. I'm just mm -hmm. saying, and this is one of the best out there, and I'm saying how bad, how behind our right, universities yeah. really right. are. Mm -hmm. my, my brother graduated from University of Lagos with a degree in mechanical engineering, and mm -hmm. one of the most shocking things that he told me is that in um, in their laboratories, they would just say, oh, you know, calculate this, but you mm -hmm. know, the results you will get is this, right. but the machine is so not working. So it's not working. a science then, if you will. Yeah, you, you, the, if the machine was working, this is what will happen. Right. Yeah. It's, 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 it's right. a calamity. And, and, and that brings me to when I came to Georgetown, you know, having graduated with microbiology, you know, one of the, uh, for, I think I was one of the three best in the in the department. And then coming here, you know, I'm like, oh yeah, of course, you know. And then I come here and I'm like, wow, the first thing I wanted to do in the laboratory when they brought like a handheld pipette was to use my mouth. You know how we oh. use it in the chemistry lab in Nigeria. Yeah, and then yeah. this, this student said, Carol, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm trying to, no, you don't use your mouth. You actually use your hand. You know, that's how behind the educational oh system is God. in Nigeria. Nigeria currently has about 124 universities, mm. okay? And this is not polytechnics. Polytechnics are about 80-something, and then you have colleges of agriculture and medicine. And then I worry about the quality of education. So we have a lot of graduates in biotechnology, microbiology, but then when we did our training in September, I'm looking at, you know, a population of people who are PhDs and lecturers who don't know what oh DNA is. Oh and, but here in the gosh. U.S., in high school, you already know some of those concepts yeah. going into college. So it's a thing of, um, it, it's a problem. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a big challenge. It's, it, yeah. You know, I when you started talking about, you know, using your mouth, because I did a bit of chemistry, chemistry. before I flunked it. <laughs> right. My dad was an engineer, and he wanted me to be an engineer. So mm -hmm. he, he literally forced me to do physics, chemistry, biology. But I remember using the pipette and the burette. And right. I remember the whole mouth thing, and to think that the world is not doing that anymore, <laughs> it, it's just scary. Yeah. But you know, okay, so I would say the Gambians, for example, they are kind of fortunate that they, there's an expectation that when you leave um, mm -hmm. high school, mm -hmm. you can go abroad. It's not mm -hmm. a new thing. Yeah. But some of these problems start from the high schools. It does, mm -hmm. and I will say one like us, not having that, it's not like we may not be able to having to know how to do science. But again, not equipped with this. Um, in Gambia, well, the system has changed a little bit. But I would say when, when I was there, we, we don't used to have a great system. It used to be form one through five, mm -hmm. where you take your yeah. GCE. Yeah. Then form three, you do 14 subjects. Mm -hmm. Now you're showing your age now. Yes, <laughs> you do, exactly. You do 14 subjects there, you're exposed to all kinds of subjects. Mm. Um, from the general science at the form two level, it becomes you specialize physics biology and things like that right. so for you to be driven to those areas you have to see something that yes. puts you there yes. all i remember seeing like folks doing the biology will get a frog and operate i can't do that <laughs> let's get this over with let me get my b or a that i could do and move on and get into my um, and that affects the careers it. that you pick, right? Exactly. Because science mm -hmm. at that level is not made to be 
um, attractive. It's not mm-hmm. what's attractive about seeing a frog die. Yeah, you know? it, it, it right. just makes it seem like whoever does it is a genius. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that, that's what it's kind of. I still feel that way. Exactly. Yeah. So because if, if if it's that way, it kind of drives you away. Right. While here we're instituting at very very early stage. Like right. my kids just finished their STEM project. Mm-hmm. As young as five, they're right. working on things like that. It becomes part of their daily right. life. So if you don't do it, it's on you, but at least you've been exposed right. to it mm-hmm. at, a, at, a, at a very, very early age. Oh, my goodness. You know, this is the challenge. So when we're talking this day about, you know, there's no cure for Ebola in mm-hmm. Nigerian laboratories and things like that, we're really late to we the are. game. Yeah. We're uh-huh. late to the game. We are, we are not... Th- this is not where we're supposed to start from. Right. Yes. We're supposed to already be talking about kids when they're young, about when they're, when they're five years old, six years right. old, the kind of things that they, they're supposed to know. Because we, my friends and I run a nonprofit in Nigeria called United for Kids Foundation. Mm-hmm. And one of the f- most fantastic terms that we had last, it wasn't this term that, just, that is just ending. It was um, the last term mm-hmm. around the June, July area. We actually got the kids in fifth grade mm-hmm. involved in little science projects. Mm-hmm. And we were surprised Amazed. how these kids took it to heart you know we told we we had them in three groups and we said they should plant you know to see how plants react to natural resources sunlight water Mm -hmm. and things like that and these kids even took it a step further there was a school that they took uh they planted um their their flowers one of the box one of the boxes had they planted with uh, soda Mm -hmm. they were watering it with soda and Mm -hmm. the soil the other one was using uh, water mm. and you know natural sunlight right. and there was one that they were using um some uh, some mixture of dirty water and some things mm-hmm. and so they came at the end of the term to show us the one that grew better the one right. of course that you know that was using sunlight right. and water right and the 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 way they were so enthusiastic mm-hmm. about this mm-hmm. just gave us ideas of how early we have to start but right. funding is an issue funding mm-hmm. is an issue funding is an issue so you can three of us can sit down here right. and say how much kids would love and um whatever but if there's no fund for right. this kind of thing right. what's right. W- what's going to happen but i'm going to take a break and we're going to talk about funding when we come back okay. but before we take that break i want to ask you about your experience in nigeria when you were you said you grew up in a, a little bit in nigeria it's just a little because my dad um does a um business so he travels we i was born in Sierra he does diamond business so ah. through transit going to zaire mm-hmm. generally nigeria is kind of like a transit place so we spend oh, some really? time there ah. and like, yeah it's kind of like there's no direct flight so you have to go through there so in between yes you you know we spend time there and then from there we go to zaire so what are some of your good memories from nigeria Apart from our jollof rice, that is. <laughs> well, I would say with jollof rice, you know, mm-hmm. one thing I know is, that, oh, jollof rice is originally from Gambia and Senegal. You know, that's not true. That, tr- so that's one that, thing we always no, try to do. I don't think that's true. No, that's so not true. When that's they not say true. jollof, we're like, do you know about the jollof tribe? It's really Gambia and Senegal. So oh, please. And that, it's but, no, Ghanaians who say it's Ghanaians. Don't yeah. mind them. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 The only no. thing you will say is the people are very, very nice, entrepreneurial, you know, everyone does business at a very early stage and things like that. And they love... um people so and people. that turned out to be great because in gambia now so we have a lot of nigerians when i you know yeah. watching the nigerian <laughs> movies i'm talking about chineke and stuff they're like where did you hear i'm like you need to find out because there's a lot of nigerians in gambia who has brought so much cultures there right, right. now yeah. the yeah. music everybody listened to is so right it's shifted nigerian. from indian movies to right. nigerian, nigerian. Movies, yes so. that is a a a, a, a <laughs> phenomenal that is just blown up yeah. it's right. so it's i'm hoping that next is quarter on the show yeah. yes we right. can bring you know people right. from nollywood to the show as well right. but we're going to take a very very a couple seconds break and when we come back we're going to talk about jail biotech and we're going to talk about you know funding and right. some of the you know achievements that you've had right. so you're watching impact africa please don't go away you are listening to impact africa to connect with the program please call 1-443-499-2755 that's one four four three four nine nine two seven five five. You may also send an email to info at impactafricaonline.com or tweet at uimpactafrica. Now, back to our show. So welcome back. I hope that that first segment allowed you a little insight into my guests and to know their background and who they are. So now we're going to go into JR Biotech. What do you do? What does JR Biotech do? 
So JR Biotech is a biotechnology education-based company that provides quality biotechnology and scientific laboratory products and services, including world-class hands-on biotechnology training to research students, scientists, and lab professionals in tertiary institutions all across Africa. So our mission is to educate, inspire, and empower a new generation of scientists to utilize modern biotechnology techniques and research methods to improve agricultural productivity, human health, industrial development, economic competitiveness, and environmental sustainability in Africa. As an accountant, all I'm hearing is <laughs> dollar signs. I'm right. just, as you're talking, I'm just hearing dollar signs. Right. Luckily, That's we have, good. we, no, I'm, I'm hearing dollar signs in terms of how expensive it to right. be to execute it this. And, you know, you, Jennifer, you are the chief financial advisor to yes. the company. Yes. You know, the first thing people think when they think about, oh, you know, tertiary institutions all over Africa. Many of these tertiary institutions are government-owned, underfunded. Right. Yes. In Nigeria, many of the professors are on strike half of the time. Yes. Mm -hmm. We say they are behind, but, you know, that's because there's hardly any funding yes. for them to even make themselves current. Yes. How, is it, how easy is it to do what she's trying to do? in terms of getting funds, attracting funds mm -hmm. to, to even start and then even to, to sustain and get people to pay for this kind of services. So uh, how easy, I don't think easy is the word there, <laughs> right. but again, with the, with the drive and passion that she has for what he's doing, nothing is impossible. Right. So um, pretty much it's more of a macro level because most of these training, these, um, these, it is provided to their students. And at the same time, this is a, more of a capital intensive equipment to build labs and things like that. And like we're saying in Nigeria, Africa as a whole, the infrastructure is not as good that you can just go in and set anything right. in mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Anybody, well, building a regular house, you just get up and do anything, not checking the lamps over right. and all that. Right. And that's not, that could something be very, very hazardous, if you right. will, to mm -hmm. just set up a lab. Mm -hmm. So of course you have to do all that. And these include capital incentives right. that you need funding at the macro level. Right. So as far as trying to target funding, we have to trying to um, look into the NGOs hmm. and the government itself, who can sponsor these programs hmm. in order to make it happen. Hmm. Because the passion is there, the drive is there, the knowledge and the know-how is there. It's just to get these directly to the people who need it. So right. the target is going to be the NGO, non-governmental institution, the, um, the World Bank, and um, the Nigerian hmm. government, and things of that nature. You know, I, I being uh, you know in the non-profit space mm -hmm. myself, I kind of find that level of funding is so difficult right. to achieve just so difficult uh, not because the money isn't there but right. because it's just hard to get people to you know they see that passion they're like ah oh, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the yeah. african governments they need money for something else right. <laughs> you know right. so how what's the reception been like well the reception is uh ha has been great because um I, I think that nigeria and most african countries at this point have seen the need for biotechnology. They have seen the impact, potential impact that it can have um, on the social level, economic level, um, and across all sectors. So we're talking about the agricultural sector, we're talking about the healthcare sector, the industries, also the environmental sector as well. So um, in our approach, talking to some uh, Nigerian government, like um, the Ministry of uh, the National Biotechnology Development Agency, which is the agency that is part of the Ministry of Science and Technology in Nigeria, mm. that oversees everything about you know biotechnology in terms of activities, in terms of GMO crops and all that in Nigeria, they had a very warm reception to our idea because it's something that is needed. So currently, I don't know if you know that, the biosafety bill now is, is in the House in Nigeria, I think in the Senate. And we're hoping that it will pass. It failed hmm. before, but they put it back um, in the house. Because, I mean, we are at a point as a continent, Africa, that we need food. Hmm. Currently, Africa's population is 1.1 billion. Hmm. By 2050, that population will double to 2.4 billion. And this will mean that we'll have 2.4 billion mouths to be fed. Looking at the agricultural sector, and many of them made, young, right? Very many young, of them very, very young. young, yeah. And the agricultural sector is very underdeveloped. So how can we produce food? We can no longer rely on natural resources because we have a rapidly declining land and water resources, and the oil prices are and crushing. Oil, they're crushing, right? So, yeah. so the idea is very attractive to everyone that we have reached out to. 
Now, being attractive doesn't mean that they are willing to bring out money because yeah. when you go to Nigeria and anywhere, you're going to always complain there is no money, there is no <laughs> money. And then you're like, okay, well, why not channel this money to something that will have an impact, direct mm -hmm. impact That's on the population? Point. But we have gotten very good reception, which encourages us to keep doing what we're doing. But a good thing about um, what we did the last time was that we approached NABDA, which is a biotechnology development agency, and they were able to bring a part sponsorship for the training we had just this September at IITA, the International ah, Institute of in Tropical Ibadan. Agriculture in Ibadan. Ibadan, Yeah. So they collaborated with us to do this training that we had, and NABDA was generous enough to sponsor part of that program. Mm. Fantastic. IITA also supported financially by providing the lab space, which they'll usually charge for, um, just to support that initial training. But in order for us to sustain this training and be able to reach out to more scientists, because we need to train scientists in the 100s, like we can't train 10 in a year or 20. We yeah. need to train as many as possible because we have. Otherwise, there's no impact. Right. There's Otherwise, no there's no impact. impact yes. Right. So, you know, I, I see. I see something positive in what we're doing at least the reception is good yeah if it wasn't good you'll know right away yeah. <laughs> they'll tell you like uh -uh. But, you know, or you'll not be able to reach them right after or the you first won't time. be able to reach them yeah. so but we are getting good reception on all levels like the universe is very interested but now we need to find a way to get the government to start paying attention in the way that they need to start providing funding for research and development across all sectors, especially the universities. Yes. Because when you're not funding the universities, you don't have the scientists who are well trained. That's and so we are talking about innovation. Okay, currently we had the Ebola situation. Yep. And then Nigeria and some other countries were begging for ZMAP. So I heard maybe yeah. it's gossip. No, uh, it's true. The, the US, okay, can you give us this experimental drug so that we can try? I mean, that is such a shame. It is. Yeah. We're talking about Nigeria is the largest economy currently in Africa, mm -hmm. is the giant yeah. of Africa in terms of population in everything. And then you're pleading for ZMAP. Yeah. When you have a population that we have very extremely intelligent people in Nigeria. I'm telling you, when you come to Nigeria, I think they are pro you probably get the one of the most intelligent set of people in Nigeria. Trust me, the training we had, it was awesome because I saw the scientists who were very passionate about what they're doing, mm. extremely intelligent. All they need is the resources. Support. And there's just no tools. The support. There's no just tools. no tools. Right. No so, tools. It's, it's, it's very frustrating. As, it I, as I'm hearing this, it's very frustrating. Yeah. But you know, Jennifer, you're a banker mm -hmm. and you've um, advised you've had clients and advise small businesses here mm -hmm. is there something that you know small businesses here do to attract the kind of funding that she needs to attract that we can take to africa perhaps yes well first of all here in the u.s we have the small business administration mm -hmm. that is a government agency we're supposed to have that in africa too exactly. Sweden. Yeah. so as i was talking to her i'm listening i'm listening again because i always have to channel it while she was talking i'm like how about getting a lobbyist that will lobby right huh um, that just came in my mind. But the Small yeah. Business Administration is a government agency that's mm -hmm. set up because um, because of the risk that is involved for startup. We all know it's risky because there is not much of a, a trend or financial numbers out there that banks can rely on in order to say, because, you know, banks want the cash flow. They want to see cash flow that pays the loan. Right. Mm -hmm. So, again, we, we, you know, we look for good summary and everything but ultimately the money that will pay for the loan hmm. so in that case then the, the 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 small business administration come in and said we want you to to stimulate um because when you small businesses create the most jobs right. here in america that mm -hmm. is a fact yeah so if True. you don't give them loan they can't hire somebody mm. who will pay taxes and stimulate the economy right. hmm. so they come up with different programs that say hey if you do this loan, we will back you up. Some right. of them will pay up till seventy. I mean, fifty percent if mm -hmm. it goes under. Mm -hmm. So at least if bank is giving a two hundred thousand, the SBA will say, that's the express actually. The SBA express will say we'll pay hundred. I mean, hundred thousand if it goes bad. Mm -hmm. And you still have you still will maintain your 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 guidelines. Right. But at least if you look at these companies that are out there that really really is needed. It will, you know, it's a no-brainer. You know, give, it's, those loans. that's that's a good idea. But as you're talking about the SBA underwriting, essentially some of these loans, mm -hmm. I I think back at a scheme that was in Nigeria mm -hmm. in um, the perhaps early '90s. Mm -hmm. It was called Better Life for Rural Women, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and by it was by one of the uh, first ladies. Mm -hmm. And one of my aunties, mm -hmm. I was in the car when my mom was asking her, have you paid back the loan that you got from Better Life? She said, no, that's my share of national cake. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I, I, 
I, I can never forget. Right. Yes. So if 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 this was happening in a place like like Nigeria and they're trying and they know that Smidan, which is a Nigerian mm -hmm. like equivalent of the SBA, SBA. Mm -hmm. is underwriting some of these loans. Mm -hmm. People are not going to be paying back. Right. Home. Well, I will tell you though, it's not necessarily hundred <laughs> percent underwriting is through the SBA. The, the primary underwriting goes through the bank. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for instance, um, you know, I'm with M and T. M and T yeah. Bank is you know where the number one SBA lender. Right. Because we're able to do a lot. Mm -hmm. So when when I go and talk to you, be like, okay, I need you to come to me because we're the SBA. will make it easier. Mm -hmm. So I'm still gonna go through my regular underwriting guideline, and I said yes. This person qualifies for SBA, and then it goes through the government. Hmm. But you pay me; you don't go to the government to pay loans, <laughs> right? because we know, as you know, as, as here in a capitalist country, whatever the government, you try to get government as less yes. involved right. as possible because of number one, a lot of red tapes, bureaucratic things like right. that. And I believe originally, at some point when the SBA started, it was probably directly through the SBA, but it wasn't the most efficient way yeah. of doing business. Right. So you go still through the financial institution, yeah. you know, it's through your credit and you have to put up, um, you have to put up your skin. They get what we call skin in the game. Yeah. If you yep. really want to do right. it, you got to put your skin in the right. game. Yep. Put your house up as a backup yep. and things like that. Whatever yep. it takes. There may not have to be equity in there, but at least you have to bring something but, that you're yeah, showing right. us yep. that, hey, yep. I am in this to, to make and, that, and that's perhaps you right. know what we need to be thinking about in Africa mm -hmm. about you know people need to have some sort of um stake yes some sort of uh, you know if I know that my house is at stake yes mm -hmm. when I when this loan goes bad I'm going to try my best right. to make sure mm -hmm. that you know it's right. it goes well right. you know but as she was talking I got some ideas do you, do you know about you win yes I do and you, you should probably apply they have you a win. deadline coming up on um, 30th of January 2015 Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I, I knew about it before, but I didn't know they still continued the Oh, program. yeah, yeah. So, but, and I, I heard that they give, like, generous grants to start kind of, start you know, this kind of business. Right. So, you know, that was a note that I made that you should probably apply. I know that okay. um, the first round, I think, January 30th, 2015, so there's still okay. enough time. Okay, I didn't and know And there's that. also Echoing Green Fellowship. If, you, mm -hmm. if you've heard about Echoing Green, that's here in the U.S., I haven't heard of that. Oh, thing. it's um, it's a funding. You might have to be poor a little bit, but <laughs> but they will basically pay you, mm -hmm. um, pay you a stipend mm -hmm. to chase this dream full time. Okay, that's good. And if, as long as you're in the startup phase, right? Something that is that is of social good. Mm -hmm. So I think with this kind of idea, right. I think you can definitely. So it's echoinggreen.org. Echoing green. Okay. Yeah. So you should probably you okay, know sure. look into that. And the, that the deadline is pretty close. It's January sixth. Okay. But you guys do it. There are, I think, 13 questions you have to answer, okay. essay type questions. But please make sure you. But let me ask you about that training that you did sure. in IITA. You know, one of my um, frustrations mm -hmm. with our system is that you train people mm -hmm. and then what? Right. You know, so you had that training. Right. And so what are people doing? Right. Afterwards. So, so the, it, it's a very good question and a very important question and a question that we all, the trainees and the trainers, had to sit down and talk about during the training program. So we offered us training, which was a one week intensive hands on training. Second to none, it was it was great because we were in an excellent facility. IITA, if you know them, yeah. they have an excellent facility because it's an international organization. It's yeah. not owned by the Nigerian Young government. government yeah. So it, it was very excellent that we had, you know, everything we need in terms of expertise and all that. So we trained other uh, scientists that represented, uh, came from more than 11 universities and hospitals and research institutes from different African nations. And so we've trained them, right? So the question we had, and we had an interview with them as well, is what do you do from now after hmm. the training? Yeah. The good thing about them, most of them that attended the training is that there are scientists or PhD students who are already working in an area of research, mm -hmm. either in a university or working in a laboratory, like a diagnostic lab in a hospital, or working in a research institute. Mm -hmm. So they already have work ongoing or mm -hmm. pursuing a PhD project that is specific um, in terms of uh, research area. But the problem that most of them, especially the PhD students had is that in the lecturers or the scientists, that they don't have a standard laboratory. So we've trained them, and what we train them on are hands-on techniques. So you have to have a lab, and you have to have all the equipment, and you have to have the reagents and everything to do the training. And so it's unfortunate that most of them might not get to use the skills that they learn, and it's something that we are now pushing to see how we can get African governments and even international donors to start paying attention to scientific research and development in Africa. 
Now, World Bank is supporting some universities and research institutes who have also Gates um, uh, funding going to some research institutes like IITA that are benefiting. But the problem is that it's sort of at a level where it's not trickling down hmm. to the people who the need this money, money. Yeah. Who, need, who are actually doing this research. So we're looking at universities that most universities don't even have any laboratories in terms of like molecular biology laboratory, which is needed at this time. So how do you, but, but you know, when you also go to the university, now in Nigeria they have a TET fund, right? Which mm. is the, from the, I think the uh, tertiary education, something from the petroleum fund, fund something, yeah, yeah. funding um, important projects in universities and tertiary institutions. Well, is that really? But then the, 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 the universities get the money and they're building auditoriums, hostels, they're building, yes. you know. <laughs> That's why I said, is that like really that. effective? But they're not building yes. laboratories. They're not even, if they build it, they'll have like a poorly built laboratory that has no equipment that works. So, you know, I've gone there and it's very heartbreaking to see this situation. So I think that we can tackle this issue, but we have to be mobilized with Africans in the diaspora because America has given us so much, but we also have not forgotten where we came from. Yeah, yeah. So we are also very passionate at this time to mobilize ourselves to go back. But we also need the people on that part of the world, which is the African part, to be receptive to our mm -hmm. ideas mm -hmm. because we have come to a point where when you go to Nigeria, for instance, if you come with somebody who's light skin, maybe Chinese or something, you know, yeah. they're like, oh, the colonial you know, mentality. Even if you don't have anything yes. to offer. Yeah. And then when they see me having a Nigerian name and being Nigerian, even though I've lived here, the yeah. reception you get is not a set. Like, what do you have that I don't right, have? That, yeah, what is it that you're yeah. coming to offer? So yeah. I think that we should change our mindset and get the governments to start paying attention to research and development because innovation cannot come about if you don't do research. We're talking about ZMAP and Ebola drugs and you know begging for drugs and all that. What if we had a standard facility where we trained our scientists to do the research to get even cure for malaria? I still yes. believe till tomorrow that we can get a vaccine for malaria Absolutely. from a scientist Absolutely. in Africa. Absolutely. Because we have the most kills there. Yes, yes. The, the, the strains so that the affect us is, are there. Yeah. 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 So even though we isolate the DNA and bring it here and then we're doing all sorts of research, I still think it will get us we have to be involved because yeah. we are the people that suffer from these diseases. Yes. We are the people who know where it hurts. Yeah. So I think that the government needs to now start funding research and development across all sectors. And you know, before we take a break, before we take a music break, because there's a song that I really want to play on the show today. It's one of my favorite childhood <laughs> okay. songs. Before we take that break, if, for example, we said, okay, she mentioned Africans in diaspora. If we said, you know, the Africans in diaspora under some sort of group, mm -hmm want to fund one um, laboratory that will be dedicated to malaria, Ebola, and some other diseases that are, you know, to, to getting people in there, how much are we talking about? How much? One small, we? yes. Like, what's the in amount of investment that we're looking at? Huh. That is a I hard can, number to I, put I, out yeah. there. Maybe I, yeah. I, I can help you with okay. that. To have mm -hmm. a standard laboratory mm -hmm. that you know can be run for a year, I think small, we'll, modest. We'll probably be looking at half a million yeah. dollars to <gasps> get started <sighs> because it's it, it, it requires a lot of capital. We're talking about one equipment can cost as much as uh, even a hundred thousand dollars or fifty thousand. Just one equipment, like the DNA sequencing equipment, just one piece. And so you know you have to have a standard laboratory. But you know there are so many ways that we can go about it. Yeah, about tech is looking at there. looking at easier options not easier but you know uh, more approachable options for us to you know, set up a facility like that using modular labs that will be a little bit more um, you know uh, fun, you know will not require too much money at the same time we want to use also solar energy to power the laboratory that way we're also helping the environment yeah. as well as having constant power supply uh -huh. because you can have a lab set up but then you don't, have, uh, you don't have electricity right? oh my so goodness oh my goodness that, like that, 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 right? and you know I I want to take this issue up in terms of mm -hmm. after the break to talk about so if we were to raise half a million dollars for example mm -hmm. how, what will we get back well if i was a shareholder in mm -hmm. in this scheme what would i get back but we'll take that up after this music break okay. so you're still watching it's back africa please don't go away <laughs>
You are listening to Impact Africa. To connect with the program, please call 1-443-499-2755. That's 1-443-499-2755. You may also send an email to info at impactafricaonline.com or tweet at uimpactafrica. Now, back to our show. Welcome back. That was one of my favorite songs when I was a kid. It was by Christy Essien Ibukwe, oh, yeah. who is late now. Mm-hmm. But Miheso, rest in peace. And yeah. I absolutely love that lady and I absolutely love that song. So I've been dying to play that song on this show for a little while. So I'm glad that I got the opportunity today. So welcome back. We're still talking about, you know, science and technology and how we are behind and what we need to do. We were talking during the break about, you know, if we raise half a million dollars, mm-hmm. People would say, you know, and we can look for maybe one million or, you know, 100,000 Africans in diaspora yes. to get a fund going. But the question is, beyond the social good mm-hmm. and people not dying from malaria, what is the need for me? Okay. And how, and even beyond what kind of dividends do I get, how does it continue to sustain itself beyond the initial capital? So it means that it needs to generate some sort of, you know, money. Yes. Are these conversations being had anywhere and how can, you know, because I think it's an important conversation, yeah, yeah. how can that happen? Mm-hmm. So I think the thing is, if you look at social media right now with the diaspora, all, all of we are on the, I guess we'll say, in the defense in a sort way. Hmm. You know, we as African, we have so much pride. Right. Hmm. The pride that we say is because anywhere we go, hmm. we make it. Hmm. Right. But it's hard where we come from to make it there because hmm. of, right. again, the infrastructure. You know, we blame the government, so many other things. But there is a reason to blame the government. But most of us here in the diaspora, we're saying, so what what can I do? What Mm -hmm. next? Everybody's looking for that place that every that one place like a congress you can just walk to mm-hmm. and, and, and 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 make it happen right yeah so i think from a dividend standpoint it's not necessarily a financial dividend right. you're going to look at right away mm-hmm. right? because everybody here at least we have a job we're paying our bills mm-hmm. yeah but but we still complain i would mm-hmm. say like yeah you know you pay but you want to be able to go home and, and able to do it there so i think that's where we're going to look at mm-hmm. the beyond of right. what is there for me because if you look at all of us individually what we do right you know we have jobs we have um 401ks and things like that that could take care of for the most part you and your family right. but we want to look beyond that mm-hmm. we want to look at building wealth building generations right. of things that sometimes we don't know where to go mm-hmm. so if we can have this fund that anybody just put something and say this is what it's going to bring mm-hmm. because ultimately if anybody no matter what that amount is 100 200 mm-hmm. 300 i was at my kids fundraising the other day they were talking about raising 40,000 mm-hmm. they say 40,000 40 people each a thousand mm-hmm. 80 people mm-hmm. each 500 right. 120 yes. so we can just use that number right mm-hmm. and we come up with a platform because when people say this is that platform that is going to build here it is the output right it's going to replicate in all over africa mm-hmm. that's what we need to start seeing and that i, I, I agree with you in. i definitely agree with you i think that people want to do good but mm-hmm. i also think that being i have a non-profit that yes. i run with my friends and yes. Raising money from people who are even affluent. Mm-hmm. Granted, my people are Nigerians, mm-hmm. and we will spend all our money on Ashwabi clothes first right. before we spend it on the science lab. <laughs> yes. No matter how much right. we want to make an impact, we right. will still want to show off and show up first. Yes. Right. So I think that when you get to that level, it might be hard mm-hmm. to get people to commit to something like that. Right. You know, they will want to do it in person, but it might be very difficult. Yes. Right. And then also the question is, then we put half a million down, mm-hmm. how about sustaining it? Right. Mm-hmm. So, so I like what Jennifer said about what we are bringing, the value that it will add to the continent of Africa, yeah. you cannot underestimate that. Yeah. So beyond what is in it for me, yeah. um, the value it will add is something that we should, number one, focus on. But mm-hmm. also as a business person, yeah. as an entrepreneur, you do have people who will invest that money and want to get something in return. Yeah. Um, so the, what we are offering um, is in is a multifold uh, kind of uh, project mm-hmm. where if we have a laboratory standard laboratory mm-hmm. uh, to do uh, training for scientists and lab professionals in the area of agriculture so we're training agricultural scientists specifically crop breeders plant breeders we're training animal breeders mm-hmm. we're training soil scientists so 
um, different kinds of sciences. And then in a biomedical aspect, we're training um, scientists who can actually work in hospitals and be able to also establish their own molecular laboratories to be able to offer diagnosed, molecular diagnostic testing for several diseases like HIV, genetic disorders, chromosomal disorders, and Ebola. all that stuff. Ebola. Even Ebola. Ah, so money yeah. can be generated from there because you'll be offering a diagnostic service that yeah. people can pay for, mm -hmm. right? Uh, to be able to get a service. Yeah. And so there will be revenue generated from, from that stream. Mm -hmm. But on the training side, uh, we have to have funding and a way to sustain it. Yeah. Then from the training, also we're training out scientists, like agriculturists, who can work, have their own laboratories, or work in their universities. When you train agricultural scientists, you're training them on how to use the techniques to improve the crop, the yeah. yield, quality, and variety. And they can pay for those trainings. Mm -hmm. Right. So in that process, they're working with smallholder farmers to be able to test these crops and, and, and be able to produce pr crops that have more quantity and also more so more quality. Mm -hmm. And by that, we are producing a lot of crops that are uh, you know, either either modified or not, mm -hmm. but we have a lot of quantity and quality for the farmers yeah. Yeah. who can sell it. And then the gov on the side of the government, they have to improve trade and investment, foreign investment, so that the farmers can be able to export Mm. some of these agricultural products yeah. and by doing so they're making profit yeah the lab is generating money right mm. by offering some of these services and working with the farmers so i think is uh, there's a lot of ways that any investor can benefit financially from it but i what i will say is that i want us to focus more on the value, the value. that it will add to both the the individuals that live there health wise if we're able to ha able to have an excellent facility for diagnostic testing that whenever we have a disease outbreak who knows what it's gonna be yeah. Yeah. tomorrow right yeah. Yeah. we can have like a place where we can contain it we can do testing we can help people out and then the disease that is already existing that is not really going anywhere yeah we can have a way to better manage it malaria yeah. so, so the value is more important because the matter how much money you want to get back you have to think of your brother or your sister who lives there and what they go through and how, how they can't even afford and yourself and then, and and you yeah. have to pay all the shots and all yeah. this but you know like, honestly i say this and I, I i bring this out just because we've been doing united for kids foundation for mm -hmm. about 13 years wow. mm -hmm. and we last year we raised about 200,000 and this year i think we're going to raise at least half a million wow. when we do our financials Wonderful. and we don't we don't give any return back apart from the value. Right. People, pe we, we post on social media, people right. give us money. So right. the, that kind of money exists. Right. But I also know that the biggest pushback that we have, mm -hmm. especially from people who are wealthy, right. who don't, who won't even lose any sleep when they give you this money is, <laughs> What is in it what for is me? In it for me? Right. The, you know, on the outside, they are not asking you that question. Right. But when you're sitting one-on-one -on -one with them, mm -hmm. it's like, or somebody gives you, you a check, and the next question they are asking you is, please, what are you going to do so that you don't come back here next year? Wow. Yes. Which I think I mean, is I like a good question. Yes. I like yes. That. Yeah. So that's why, thing. exactly. So it's that's right. why, you right. know, these questions, I, I'm, I, right. I think that what you're doing is like fantastic. Right. I think it's like value adding. But I think that you should be ready for that question. Right. Whether they ask it or they don't right. even ask it. Right. We <laughs> are ready for that question. That's yeah. what we're looking at. If we only rely solely on the training, then, yeah. you know, it might be hard for us to sustain sustain yeah. that program. Yes. Because we don't want to go out there and look for funding every minute, every month. To You'll be, be exhausted. To do a, a training because, yeah. It's, yeah, it's very exhausting. You want to do what you do so best. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. right now we're in a planning stage where we're looking at programs that, can, that we can generate revenue from you know by having like a facility where we're offering like i said diagnostic services people pay to do lab tests right yes, yes. Um, but even though it's going to be subsidized it's not going to be in a way that you're not generating some kind of profit you know yeah. from it to sustain the training part of things Absolutely. but i just want to say that when we're training the scientists we're also we also are helping them to develop high impact research projects mm -hmm. aiming to improve food security and also help to develop modern um, um healthcare products such as vaccines and drugs and stuff by doing that by training them and having them have a space that works for them to do research they can invent something tomorrow yeah that yeah. is going to be used by the world not yes. just in africa exactly so you know yeah. that is what we're looking at but we have to start at the basics we have to get started 
um, in that way. But and the government has to the invest. They have to invest because this, the, when something is long term, yes. the 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 surest investor that stands to gain anything is the government, the government. because yes. people are paying taxes. But right. before before we wrap this up, I want to talk about you know a partnership that I think might work. Okay. You mentioned that you both met at the Africa Trade Office. What right. is the Africa Trade Office? Um, the Africa Trade Office is in um, Prince George's County, part of the Economic Development Corporation of Prince George's County. But I believe the Africa Trade Office was born um, back in the early administration of the Obama um, administration. I think Senator Ben Cardin mm -hmm. um, brought it to Maryland. Mm -hmm. uh, what they're talking about is instead of Africa having aid all the time, right. mm -hmm. sending aid to Africa, it's time that do more partnership. And I think right. this is the thing that President Obama talked about in his yeah, visit right. when he went to Africa. So um, because of some funding, it ended up, ending up in the Prince George's County, which we're, you know, both of us live in and right. we mm. walk. So we're happy that it ended up in there. We right. have a, a great director leader who is yes. Dr. Forker, yes. mm. which awesome. recruited all of us based on the passion, seeing what we do right. in the community and what that um, group does is called the CABC, which is Continental Africa Business Bureau. All of us is business owners or we lead businesses. So ways that we advise the Africa Trade Office right. on how Africa Trade, because again, it's a government agency here right. in the United States, um, but at least we are folks that are born or live mm, up yes. there, um, how we can do business. For instance, this conversation we're having here, to bring it to the table here so the, the locals yes. right. here will know how to go through that way. Yes. Right. So in the Africa Trade Office um, has had, um, this year we had a very, very successful Africa right. Trade Summit. We brought a lot of people Fantastic. from the continent. Oh, it kind nice. of coincided at the same time with the U.S. Africa. Africa. Yes. Trade Summit. So right. it was very, Fantastic. very successful. And we're looking forward to the next one next August again. Right. And it's bringing, trying to foster trade between America and, and, and the Africa U.S. And Prince George's County right now is trying to apply for the, the free trade zone. Right. So when you live in that county, when you're trying to do international mm -hmm. trade, yeah. you don't have to go through a whole lot of trips. That is, that is um, exciting because right. I'm doing some Great research trade. right now because I'm also applying for Equine Green for Impact Africa for the okay. show. And one of the things that I'm reading currently is the amount of um how the u.s is losing ground mm. to china to when china. it comes to right. business yeah. in africa mm -hmm. right. you know and this this is very interesting because i really would like to get in touch with the africa trade office mm -hmm. because one of the things that i think can come out of jr biotech mm -hmm. for example is if the farmers are getting trained mm -hmm. and they are you know getting better crops and they're able to export it with trading partners here right Yes. in the u.s right mm -hmm. that is a win-win right. for everybody yeah. right. people who are asking what is in it for me right that's that's something new for you if right. you have a business in the right. in the in the diaspora right. and you you have a trading partner in africa in that africa. is a farmer that's giving yes. you quality good quality right. stuff mm -hmm. right this is this is great and right. i think we have a seminar that i believe is opic right uh opec or opec or whatever OPEC. They did. OPEC. Yeah, yeah they came over they talk about how you can fund your uh, right. business and that was a very education part so again that's one thing the africa trade office do bring a lot of resources mm -hmm. to yeah. most businesses you know um things of that nature that's why i love um what carol does because she's on the ground yes. you know because most people and i believe you are too what you do <laughs> yes. because yes. most people are here but again going on that ground yes is, is very it's very a different ball game. I, give, a different ball game. I give it that's a lot to them and yeah I, and, right. I, and i i am um, that's it, one of the things i really enjoy it's, yeah. it's a different ball game and i, I think that honestly this is an area a lot of people don't want to touch. Right. Science and technology. Right. And right. because first of all, it's expensive. It is complicated. Right. It is um, many of times it's even a male-dominated environment. So it to is. see a woman who is trying to do Absolutely. this, I, honestly, I really salute you. Thank you. I salute you for the support because I know you. you don't only support her. You also support uh, Nike. Mm -hmm. Nike Campbell Fatoki, the the writer. She was also on this show before. Yes. So you know this. You're yeah. doing great Jennifer's stuff. Amazing. Yeah, yeah, I know. So yeah. well, I I, I'm looking at the time. I'm like, oh my goodness, mm -hmm. we're really out of. Time. <laughs> but I want to thank you so much. I hope thank that we you. can, you know, we can take this conversation forward. Right. Not just talk about what you're doing, but also one day my goal is that somehow Impact Africa is involved when the first lab right. opens its yes. door. Right. You know. Right. And in, and, and, yes, in, in Nigeria, awesome. I, I'm hoping so. Yes. Well, thank you so much for you. you know tuning in today. Yes. You will definitely get a lot more from um, following both our um, guests today on social media jr Bi biotech, biotech please you know follow them on social media and be a part of this revolution because if science and technology cannot you know wake africa up nothing else can right and so this is the future thank you so much until next week when i come back again please keep impacting africa good morning thank you for tuning in to impact africa please join us again next sunday at 9 a.m eastern time 1 p.m gmt at listenvisionlive.com. Have a good week and keep impacting Africa.